Sometimes it all comes down to one moment, just a few fateful hours or even minutes. This can be the difference between success, stalemate, defeat, or even complete annihilation. In part one of our series, we covered the German 3rd Parachute Division at the Falaise Pocket, the 33rd Waffen SS Grenadiers at the Fall of Berlin, the 21st Panzer Division at El Alamein, the 4th Marines at Manila Bay, and the 1st, 3rd, and 4th Rangers at Anzio, as well as the various defenders ordered to defend Budapest to the last. If you haven't had a chance to watch that first part yet, it's well worth a look and examine some of the most remarkable and ultimately tragic episodes of the entire war. Today, we're introducing part two and looking at five more World War II units that suffered annihilation at the hands of the enemy. On both sides of the conflict, units were wiped off the map, perhaps by a tactical error or simply a bad twist of fate, leaving comrades and loved ones behind to deal with the loss. Well, hopefully your units managed to avoid destruction in War Thunder, the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made. Play for free on PC, Xbox, and PlayStation, and experience thrilling and dynamic combined arms PvP in the 2000 tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships. Each of those vehicles are incredibly detailed and modeled down to their components, offering players a highly immersive combat experience. The vehicles in War Thunder span over 100 years of development from the 1920s all the way to now. War Thunder offers incredible graphics and detail in 4K resolution, along with authentic sound effects and beautiful music credit an atmosphere to fully immerse yourself in. Best part is, you don't need any fancy equipment to pilot, you can just use your mouse and keyboard. War Thunder also has one of the most dynamic and detailed vehicle damage models in gaming, basically showing players what the actual damage to their vehicle is. As someone who loves playing War Thunder on the PS5, this is one of my favorite things, being able to see exactly which component was damaged or which crew member was actually hurt. For a limited time only, new players as well as those who haven't played for six months or more can claim a large bonus pack which includes multiple premium vehicles, premium account features, an exclusive 3D decorator for your vehicles, and so much more. Play War Thunder now for free using our link below. The chaos of the beaches, the scrambled rescue attempt, the mobilization of civilian ships and boats, Prime Minister Winston Churchill delivering his immortal speech to the House of Commons. We know, or at least we think we know, quite a bit about the evacuation of Dunkirk in 1940. The action that was at once both a crushing defeat and a vital lifeline for the British Army in Europe. Perhaps less well known are the stories of those who never made it to the beaches, the units ordered to stay behind and prevent a German advance that could annihilate Allied forces before they even had a chance to make it home. Thousands of British and French soldiers stood, fought and died side by side in the villages and countryside of northern France in May and June of 1940. The second battalion of the Royal Norfolk Regiment was among them. As May 1940 entered its final week, the men of the 2nd Battalion would have understood the magnitude of the task they faced. In the villages of Le Paradis, Le Connemal, and Ria du Vinage, the Norfolks held their ground. Charged with forming roadblocks and holding off the German advance, it's possible that the Norfolks had already recognized the true nature of their mission. They would be facilitating the rescue of thousands of British troops, but no such rescue would be coming for them. By May 27th, this would have become all too clear. Cut off from their battalion headquarters, with no hope of resupply, their ammunition ran out. With nothing to throw at the advancing Germans, the remaining 97 men of the 2nd Norfolks could do nothing but surrender. The 2nd SS Tottenkopf or Death's Head Regiment, a unit notorious for its ruthlessness and brutality, accepted the surrender but did not accept the men as prisoners. Instead, the Norfolks had their weapons and identity badges ripped from them and were marched out into open farmland where machine guns were waiting. Here, the 97 were torn to pieces by machine gun fire in a mass execution before revolvers and bayonets finished the job. Miraculously, two of the men did survive, were sheltered by sympathetic locals, and were eventually captured by less brutal German units. They would survive the war. Their comrades would be hastily buried by the French villagers under the observation of the occupying German troops. Today, they lie in La Paradis Cemetery in a section designated as a war grave site. The massacre was part of the systematic eradication of British troops from northern France. On the same day the 2nd Norfolks met their end, the 2nd Battalion of the Royal Warwickshire Regiment surrendered at Warmhout. The Warwickshires were forced into a nearby barn by their German captors who tossed hand grenades in after them. 
the two survivors of Le Paradis would eventually have a small piece of revenge. In January 1949, following a testimony from surviving Norfolk soldier Bill O'Callaghan, the German officer who had ordered the massacre was sentenced to death. Fritz Knöchlein would atone for his crime at the end of a hangman's rope. This likely offered only scant comfort to the families of those unarmed men gunned down in a French field one day in May 1940. They were known as the Texas Battalion because they were formed from the Texas National Guard. But in October 1944, the men of the 1st Battalion, 141st Infantry Regiment of the 36th Division found themselves a long way from home. Deep in the Vosges region of eastern France, some four months on from D-Day, advance units were clearing a path for the Allied main force on their way to the German border. But in this rugged, mountainous landscape, they were met with dogged resistance from German units. Special forces operations here had been moderately successful, but there was still a huge job to do, and the Texas Battalion was one of the units that had to do it. Major General John E. Dahlquist was convinced of success, but his senior officers were not so sure. The general decided to execute his plan anyway, sending the 1st Battalion forward into the Vosges to clear a strategic ridge held by German troops. The battalion, perhaps overstretched, perhaps sent in prematurely to capture a hopeless objective, found themselves cut off. Major General Dalquist ordered the units to withdraw, but in the unforgiving terrain of the Vosges, these orders only reached the flanking units. The 1st Battalion never received this word to retreat, and by the time they realized they were without flanking support, they were completely cut off. There were 275 men trapped in the Vosges, encircled by enemy troops. Their countrymen and the 141st Infantry's other battalions failed to reach them. The 405th Fighter Squadron did reach them, but could only keep them resupplied as repeated rescue attempts were pushed back by staunch German resistance. Time was running out for the Texans. The 442nd Regimental Combat Team was enjoying a well-earned rest period after their hard-fought victories at Bourrier and Bifontin. Liberating the towns had come at a heavy cost, but this rest period would be cut short when they received the call from General Dalquist. The 275 men trapped in the Vosges were in desperate need of rescue. The 442nd was an unusual unit. These soldiers were Nisai, a Japanese term literally meaning second generation, referring to those of Japanese descent who were born in the US, and they had been segregated from other units in the American Armed Forces. While their family members and loved ones back home waited out the war in internment camps as symbols of distrust for many Americans, the men of the 442nd fought with incredible valor, taking enormous casualties in service of a country that viewed them with suspicion. By October 26th, the 2nd and 3rd battalions of the 141st Infantry were exhausted, while their brothers of the 1st remained pinned down. The 442nd arrived to relieve the ailing troops, and a remarkable five-day campaign began. The Nisai American soldiers fought with the courage and resilience that had become their trademark, reaching the Texans on October 30th. Incredibly, they rescued 211 men, suffering over 800 casualties in the process. Even this was not enough for the men of the 442nd. A detachment of around 50 troops of the regiment ran a daring mission in the hope of outflanking German troops in the Vosges and rescuing the remaining Texans from the rear. This move was a valiant failure, and all but five of these rescuers were killed or taken prisoner. The captured 442nd troops would eventually be freed in April 1945 when their prison camp at Moosburg fell. When the size of the regiment and the length of its service are taken into account, no American unit of the war received more medals than the 442nd. The 100th Infantry Battalion, of which the 442nd was a part, would become known as the Purple Heart Battalion because of its vast numbers of wounded. The men of the 1st Battalion, 141st Infantry, on the other hand, would become known as the Lost Battalion, named for those few days in October 1944 when they were swallowed by the Vosges Mountains and all but wiped out by the German troops they found there. When Australian troops landed on the Bismarck Archipelago, New Guinea, in 1914, occupying this far-flung outpost of the German Empire, it may have seemed like a sideshow to the conflict unfolding in Europe. 
Certainly, the slaughter of Gallipoli the following year has consigned the New Guinea action, rightly or wrongly, to the status of a footnote in Australia's First World War history. In 1941, however, Australia's situation would have felt a little more urgent. Growing Japanese ambitions in the Pacific made Australia nervous. An expansion southwards might threaten the nation itself and would certainly put the territory she administered in New Britain in harm's way, as well as the civilians who lived and worked there. In March and April, the 2-22nd Battalion was sent to Rabol, New Britain, to set up a small but strategically crucial garrison. They would become known as Lark Force. If the outbreak of war in December 1941 left Prime Minister John Curtin unsurprised, the speed of Japan's advance might have caught him a little off guard. On January 4, 1942, less than a month after war was declared, a massive campaign of aerial bombing brought Japanese fury raining down on Rabaul. Wing Commander John Leroux operated a Royal Australian Air Force unit in the area, running reconnaissance missions out of Lakunai and Vunakanao, but his small force of four Hudson aircraft and ten Wirraways was almost destroyed in the onslaught. Finding themselves in the back foot, the Australian commander ordered the remaining RAAF crews to withdraw, tearing up the airfields as they left. By the early hours of January 23rd, a Japanese invasion force of more than 5,000 men was pouring onto the island. Spread thinly across the coast at Rabaul, Lark Force struggled to resist. The Japanese landed almost unopposed in many sectors, while an aerial bombardment inflicted punishing damage on the defenders. Rabaul and the surrounding area would be in Japanese hands long before dawn rose on the 24th. 76 officers and some 1,314 men of various ranks had defended Rabaul, and around 300 Australian civilians, including six nurses attached to Lark Force, were also caught up in the invasion. Two of the officers and 26 men were killed in the initial fighting, while around 400 fled into the thick jungle of New Britain, braving brutal terrain as they sought to evade capture. One of the 400 was Barney Kane, who served with the 17th Anti-Tank Battery. Speaking in 2021, Barney, who is from Rye, Victoria, and is believed to be the last surviving member of Lark Force, described his remarkable experiences as he dodged Japanese patrols and battled the elements. We were running from the Japanese, and you had one thing on your mind. Feet, do your duty, he said. It would be three and a half months before Barney and his comrades arrived at Port Moresby, where they were shipped back to Australia. Many of the remnants of Lark Force would not be so lucky, and those captured found that surrender was no guarantee of safety. Japanese abuse of Allied prisoners of war is well documented, but what happened at the Toll Plantation in February 1942 is a horrifying and oft-forgotten chapter in this story of misery. At Toll, around 160 survivors of the defense of Rabaul were put to death. Some were shot, others died at the point of a bayonet blade. The handful of men who survived the atrocity at Toll would later testify against their captors after the war in a court of inquiry. Other captives would perish for very different reasons. A large number of the 800 prisoners were loaded into the Montevideo Maru transport ship ready to be taken to Japanese prison camps. When a US submarine encountered the Montevideo Maru and saw its Japanese livery, the sub opened fire, sealing the fate of most of the ship's crew and their prisoners. Colonel Kionao Ichiki, commander of the elite and experienced 28th Infantry Regiment, had an idea. It was a bold and risky idea, but if successful, it would see the Japanese forces seize Henderson Field and tip the balance of the Guadalcanal campaign in their favor. And so, just after midnight on August 21st, 1942, the first wave of the Japanese attack traversed the slope on the eastern bank of the Tanaru and began their advance across a sandbar to the enemy positions on the other side. In his war memoir, Helmet for My Pillow, Robert Leckie likened the Tanaru River to a serpent, green and evil. It was not a river at all, in Leckie's estimation, but a creek, and sometimes not even that because it didn't always flow, separated as it was from the ocean by a spit of sand some 40 feet wide. It was this spit of sand the 28th Infantry now advanced across. It was a matter of minutes before the battalion commanders on the Tanaru understood the magnitude of the mistake. 
Like crimson blossoms was how one soldier described the American machine gun fire that poured down on the four columns as they advanced, bright as searchlights. As the cloying sand gave way beneath their feet, the Japanese soldiers presented an easy target to the gunners on the west bank. Al Schmid, an assistant gunner for the 2nd Battalion 1st Marines, described the assault as like a bunch of cows coming down to drink. Watching on, appalled from the east bank, 2nd Company Commander Captain Tetsuro Sawada sent a runner to find out just what the hell was going on at the American line. The runner, barely escaping with his own life, reported that the officer leading the charge, Lieutenant Ohashi, lay gravely wounded on the other side, along with most of his men. There were American casualties. Some of the 28th had survived the assault, knocking out gun emplacements and killing some of the American defenders. The situation, however, was hopeless. A reserve American detachment was mopping up the few Japanese who had broken through, and most of the wave lay wounded or dead in the creek on the western bank. The 28th must retreat. Barely an hour and a half into August 21st, the first Japanese attack had been shattered by the Marines on the west bank of the Tenaru. And yet, Colonel Ichiki was unwilling to change his tactics. At 2.30 am, the second wave attacked, and between 150 and 250 more Japanese soldiers were fed into the meat grinder, stumbling over the corpses of their fallen brothers in the shallows before they, too, fell to American machine gun fire. But Ichiki believed victory was still within reach. Regrouping to the east of the Tenaru, the Japanese troops let fly with mortar rounds, attempting to soften up the American positions for a third assault. The Americans responded with fire of their own, and more Japanese fell. At 5am, Ichiki ordered a third assault. This time, the men of the 28th would bypass the sandbar, wading westwards through the ocean waves and launching an assault further up the beach. Again, this was repulsed with massive casualties. As dawn rose and the winter light illuminated the bloody mess at the mouth of the Tenaru, now choked with corpses, the surviving Japanese soldiers must have felt as if they had already endured a lifetime's worth of hell on August 21st. And yet, the day was just beginning. As the Japanese target of Henderson Field still lay in Allied hands, the Americans began flying sorties from the airstrip, strafing the 28th Infantry as they scrambled for cover. American tanks were ordered across the sandbar, breaking out onto the Japanese side and shattering the pockets of resistance that remained there. By 5pm, 12 hours after the final desperate Japanese assault, the battle was over. Sometime on that chaotic day, Colonel Kionao Ichiki had lost his life, perhaps killed by American fire or perhaps committing ritual seppuku suicide, now fully understanding that his bold decision had been a catastrophic error. The colonel would just be one of around 800 Japanese soldiers who laid down their lives where the Tenaru River meets the sea. Had everything gone to plan, the Vicenza would likely never have been on the front lines at all. The 156th Infantry Division was deployed in eastern Ukraine as a reserve unit, keeping communication lines clear for the troops in advanced positions. But this was January 1943 on the Eastern Front, and for the Axis, nothing was going to plan. With the German 6th Army surrounded and facing defeat at Stalingrad, the Soviet forces were able to turn their attention to the Axis troops on the Don River. The task of smashing these forces, largely Italian and Hungarian divisions, fell to General Filip Golikov's men who were happy to oblige after the misery of autumn and early winter 1942. Golikov's men succeeded in pushing back the already weakened German 24th Army Corps, all but destroying the Hungarian 2nd Army at Svoboda. Between these two positions were the Alpini, Italy's Alpine Army Corps. The Alpini were highly capable troops, able to fight even in the most difficult of terrain. But their commander, General Gabriel Nassai, knew they could not hold off the Soviets alone, and on January 17th, he ordered his divisions to fall back. The retreat was a desperate one. Some 40,000 men, mainly Alpini and the remnants of other Italian divisions, but with Germans and Hungarians among them too, beat a disordered retreat back to the west and relative safety of the Axis lines. But to reach the line, they must break through the Soviet forces 
would close the pincers on them to the west. On January 25th, Soviet artillery fire squeezed the remaining columns, limiting their options for escape. Their only chance of survival lay at the village of Nikalevka, where the Soviet 48th Guards Rifle Division stood in their way. On the morning of the 26th, the 1st Alpini divisions reached the village. The Italians, now desperate, launched an attack, avoiding the Russian fortifications on either flank with a frontal assault. Ground was hard fought and hard won, but the Italians made progress, pushing into the village and coming tantalizingly close to the breakout that would offer some hope of salvation. As the day wore on and the light began to fade, General Luigi Revaberi of the Tridentina Division ordered a last gasp assault. It would be a human wave attack, bringing whatever force the remaining Italians could muster down on the 48th Guards. Somehow, it was a success. At Nikolaevka, the Alpini punched through the Soviet encirclement and pushed on to rejoin the Axis lines beyond. January 26th would go down as an Italian victory of sorts, although the only victory was an escape from complete annihilation. However, not all the Italian divisions at Nikolaevka would be granted this reprieve. Initially held in reserve, the 156th Infantry Division was closer to full strength than most of the other Alpini units. First caught up in the retreat, and then snared by the Soviet encirclement, the Vicenza now found themselves not just at the enemy lines, but also behind them. The men fought bravely, desperate to push on with their compatriots to the resupply area, but here, the Soviet line was stronger, and the exhausted division found themselves cut off. On the afternoon of January 6th, some four kilometers east of the town of Valuki, the Vicenza was annihilated. A handful of men would reach the Axis line days later, but the majority fell to Soviet fire, their bodies littering the borderlands between Russia and Ukraine. In some cases, it was a tactical blunder. Colonel Ichiki's direct assault across Tenaru cost him and his men their lives, while Major General John Dalquist went against the advice of his officers and sent his Texas battalion into the jaws of the enemy. In others, the hands of fate and circumstance dealt the cards. The Lark Force was simply too small to mount a meaningful defense against the Imperial troops of Japan sweeping across the Pacific. The Vicenza was never intended to be at the front at all. In all these stories though, there are common threads. Bravery, valor, and extraordinary deeds in extraordinary circumstances. There are lessons to be learned too. War is costly, and often the loser pays the ultimate price complete annihilation. But what do you think? Could crises have been averted for any of these units? What could have gone differently? Different orders, different circumstances, or simply a different roll of the dice? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section below. And as always, guys, thank you so much for watching, and I hope you learned something new. Massive thanks to War Thunder for sponsoring the video. To experience epic World War II PvP battles in planes, tanks, ships, and much more, be sure to head to the link in my description and take advantage of the large bonus pack War Thunder is offering, including multiple premium vehicles, premium account features, the 3D vehicle decorator, and much more.